to be a really good presenter, you need to be a really good listener. And I know that either sounds counterintuitive or corny, and I'm willing to embrace either or both of those. (laughs) But one of the things that I think believe make somebody a very strong presenter is their interest and willingness to think about the audience first, listen to what the audience wants and needs to hear, and then you construct your presentation or your argument around that. This is Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business. Our guests share the advice, insights, and inspiration to help you transform as a leader. I'm Alan Todd, your host and the Vice President of Leadership Development at Udemy. Together, we can work, lead, and live differently. Everything we say or don't say can do two things, build trust or erode trust. This is true for leaders at any career stage. How you communicate is at the cornerstone of how you build trust in the workplace. This week on Leading Up, we are talking to an expert on the foundations of leadership communication. Deborah Grayson Regal is an executive coach, consultant, and keynote speaker. She teaches leadership communication at some very impressive business schools, including the Wharton School, Duke's Fuqua School, and Columbia Business School's Women in Leadership Program. She writes for Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and Inc. Magazine, and her most recent book is titled Go to Help, 31 Strategies to Offer, Ask for, and Accept Help. Deb, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alan, for having me. I'm excited to be here today. All right. Thank you. All right. So the famous Edelman Trust Barometer has been measuring trust among people all over the world for 32 years. And something surprised me this year just with how polarized we are. When asked if a person strongly disagreed with me or my point of view, a super majority of people said they wouldn't help them, they wouldn't work with them, and they wouldn't even want to live in the same neighborhood as them. So most communication is breaking down, not building trust. So let's unpack this idea, Deb, of communicating to create trust. What does that look like and why is it so hard? Well, one of the reasons why it's so hard is that we have a whole range of cognitive biases, so shortcuts in how we think about things and make decisions that get in our way. So this could be anything from the confirmation bias, where we are uh, unconsciously looking for information that confirms our point of view and the way that we see the world, something called an availability heuristic, which is where we give more credence to information that is readily available to us rather than doing the work of finding out other information. And one of my favorite biases, which of course is a very nerdy thing to have, but one of my favorite biases is called the closeness communication bias. And what this basically means is that the closer you are to somebody, the less likely you are to actually listen to them because you are already completing their sentence in your head. I call it the marriage bias. (laughs) because I have no doubt that I do that to my husband, Michael, all the time. But we have a whole bunch of ways that are geared to helping us make quicker decisions in the world that are also getting in the way of the communication we need to really build trust. So what do we have to do, let's say, to become aware of these biases or to not be biased by them? Yeah. So uh, those are two separate things that are both important. So the first is how do we become aware of them? So uh, unfortunately, it is hard to become aware of them just using our own self-awareness. It, you know, there's this wonderful David Foster Wallace vignette where there's an old man fish swimming in the sea and he turns to the two younger fish behind him and he goes, hey kids, how's the water today? And the two little fish look at each other and they go, what's water? And the point of that is, is that if we're swimming in it, we don't even notice that it's happening. So one of the most important things that we can do is to have relationships that can help us develop insight, where we have people in our lives who can give us helpful, healthy, honest, and forward-focused feedback. A really good question is to ask somebody, what do you think 
I tend not to pay attention to? What do you think I tend to minimize? What do you think might be some of my blind spots? And even just starting to have that conversation can give you a little bit of insight. And then remember that you are going to have some biases that are going to have you not want to listen to this, right? All of these self self-protective biases that we have. And so you're going to have to remind yourself to take in the information, maybe even to write it down so that you can think about it at another time when you're not feeling flooded or defensive. And to ask yourself one of my favorite feedback questions, which is, even if I saw this as 98% false and 2% true, what is the 2% true that would help me embrace that I could get better at? Wow. So who would we ask that? Is this like somebody that's a really good friend, a high level of trust when you're seeking this kind of feedback? So I, I think there are two criteria that we want to take a look at. So number one is that it's somebody whom we trust. So somebody where we believe that there's not going to be punishment, reprimand, retribution in the relationship. So a relationship where there's a, a feeling of safety and somebody who you know will be honest for the benefit of your growth and success. So I have lots of great friends that I can ask for feedback and they are probably people I, they're definitely people I trust. And I would wonder whether they could be really, really honest for the benefit of my growth and success. And somebody who would be really honest with you for the benefit of your growth and success, but you don't trust, that's not going to be valuable feedback either because you'll just you'll just shut it down. So someone who cares about you, someone that you trust that will give you honest feedback. Yeah. And they care about the you t- who's here today and they care about the you who's going to be doing things tomorrow and they want to help that future version of you get better. Let's talk to our early career listeners. Why should we start honing our communication skills early in our careers? So I want to just acknowledge that we all have communication skills. We all have ways of communicating that have worked, and we have ways of communicating that haven't worked. And one of the first things that we can do as a young professional is start to gather some data about what has worked pretty well consistently in what situations and with whom, and where do we notice that we're actually not getting the impact that we're looking for. So you actually don't even need another person to help you think that through. That being said, it's important for us to get better at communicating, more strategic at communicating, and maybe most importantly, more flexible in communicating because communication is core to every single relationship we have at home, in our communities, and in our jobs. There is nothing you can do to avoid communicating, and even not communicating is a form of communication. All right. You're reminding me of Warren Buffett said uh, the one easy way to become worth 50 percent more than you are now is to hone your communication skills, both written and verbal. And I remember him. I think he famously did this at Columbia Business School, if I'm not mistaken. But it was like every one of you uh, graduating students are going to get an MBA. I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars if you give me a certain percentage of your income for the rest of your life. Like I'll, I'll I'll write you a check right now. And if you're a good speaker, I'll give you $150,000. And the point he was trying to make is that there's like a 50% premium on this. So it's every, you know, he's reinforcing the point that you just made. Do you have any tips for our listeners on like verbal communication, speaking in meetings or presenting ideas to colleagues? How can we be more persuasive? I'm actually going to start with the idea that to be a really good presenter, you need to be a really good listener. And I know that either sounds counterintuitive or corny, and I'm willing to embrace either or both of those. But one of the things that I believe makes somebody a very strong presenter is their interest and willingness to think about the audience first, listen to what the audience wants and needs to hear, and then you construct your presentation or your argument around that. So most speakers start with, okay, let me think about what I want to tell them. And I think that's a later step. 
The first step is who is this audience? What is keeping them up at night? And what am I prepared to tell them that will address what's keeping them up at night? We are far more wired to avoid losses and pain than we are wired to move towards pleasure. So your presentation actually needs to show how you are going to prevent or alleviate some pain point for the people in your audience. So you are secondary to the audience. Just a a question building on that audience first. You wrote a piece where you were going to speak at a big audience and a big crowd and closing and time constraints, and you were forced to condense something that was whatever, 45 minutes to eight minutes or something. How do you become agile? What was the lesson you learned from that? And What's your advice? Yeah. So I was agile before that happened. My background, in addition to being in communication skills and coaching, is that I spent seven years performing improv comedy. As a result of that, it has become a strong muscle of mine to be able to think on my feet and adapt. And I have to say, I recommend improv for anyone who feels like their spontaneity muscle hasn't gotten a workout in decades. So I do recommend that. But, you know, in the moment, I had to do what I just said earlier, which is I had to put the audience's needs first. So even though I had parts of this presentation that I wanted to talk about that felt important to me, I had to very quickly winnow it down to what are the two or maybe two and a half things that this audience needs to get out of this in order to alleviate some pain points for them. And I just focused on that. I also was careful, and I think this is just a good general communication and leadership tip. I was really careful to acknowledge the shift in the agenda without throwing anybody under the bus. And I think that is so important. If your PowerPoint doesn't work, don't throw your tech team under the bus, right? If your meeting gets short, don't throw the meeting planners under the bus. Trust me, you need them way more than they need you. So bounce back, be resilient, be positive, move on. Yeah, I love it. A great summary too. just be resilient and be positive. And I really like how you frame everything through the eyes of the audience, not you as the presenter, but the audience, the listener. I think that requires a lot of empathy. And I think that's uh, powerful. I think that's a, a really important point to make, which is very related to what we're talking about today, that one of those communication skills that we need to hone if we haven't already is around empathy. And the research shows that there are three kinds of empathy that we need to get better at. The first is cognitive empathy, which is I understand what you're thinking and why you would think that, even if I don't think that, right? But I can understand how you would think that, even if I have different thoughts. The second is emotional empathy, which is I can understand how you would feel that way and that you feel that way, even if if I were in your situation, I might feel something totally different. And then the third part of empathy is compassionate empathy, which is if I understand what you're thinking and what you're feeling, I also want to communicate that I'm I'm here to help. Yeah, that's so interesting and a, and a really, really good point. Just basic stuff. Yeah, so I think maybe head, heart, and hands, right? That hands makes up the, and I'm here to lend a hand. Yeah, head, heart, and hands. Yes. So I started with that comment about Edelman and trust breaking down. Let's say we achieve a strong foundation of trust at our company, right? So we work in an organization, we have that. What are some of the advantages of that and where can we take that? Yeah, so some of the advantages of having trust in a relationship, they are business benefits, they're interpersonal, they're health-related. So everything from, and, and we know a lot of this from Stephen Covey's 
classic book, The Speed of Trust. So we know that when there is trust in organizations, there's less churn, there's less turnover, there's less redundancy, less bureaucracy, all the things that frustrate people at work. And we also know that there are interpersonal benefits. People tend to feel less stressed. People have less burnout. People actually have stronger immune systems when they work in cultures that are high in trust. And people feel like they can innovate more when they trust that they can make a mistake and be given the grace to learn from that mistake and bounce back. So there isn't actually any any part of our work lives and our personal lives that doesn't benefit from working in a, a culture that is high in trust. And I also want to say that many of the clients, leaders, and teams that I work with are working in organizations where the trust in the culture doesn't feel high and they're not sure what to do. So just to quickly define some terms, I think of culture as the way we do things around here. And especially if you're an early career professional, you're going to look at your organization and say, well, what do you expect me to do changing the culture of an organization that is 30, 50, 100 years old, right? I'm I'm all the way down here. And so what I'll often say to folks, whether they're early in their career or later in their career and still feeling like I'm just not in a position in my career to impact the culture, I say, stop thinking about culture and start thinking about climate. So culture is the way we do things around here. Climate is the way I do things around me. And I've got a significant amount of autonomy, no matter how many... Uh, years of experience I have, no matter where I am in the organization, to decide how I do things around me. So even if I am in a culture, for example, that doesn't give a lot of feedback, where things don't feel particularly transparent about who's doing what and why, in my climate around me, I can give it and ask for feedback. I can be transparent and ask for transparency about what people are doing and why. So just think about your first and second concentric circles of relationships around you, and that can start to make a significant difference. It feels like it also brings agency to the person. So it's me changing that. So let's assume now we've got this feeling there's trust, agency, climate. How do we deal with conflict in the organization. Obviously, conflicts are bound to arise. And how do you think about that and teach us how to deal with all types of conflict? Yeah. So the first thing that I like to do is normalize the idea of conflict. So (laughs) let me just ask you this. When I say the word conflict to you, how do you feel? Uh, anxiety ridden. Yes. Good. You are like most of us, right? Anxious, stressed, overwhelmed, resistant, right? Curl in a ball, lie in the fetal position, all of those things. And so I like to start by normalizing conflict. The first way I like to start by normalizing conflict is by offering a definition of conflict that really normalizes it. So I see conflict as a disagreement or a difference of opinion or perspective. So if I think about in a typical day, let alone a week or a month, in a typical day, how often I'm having a disagreement or a difference of opinion or perspective with somebody, I think I probably average that five times a day, okay? And I don't even tend to note that as conflict, even though it is conflict where we're just not seeing things the same way. What I do register with those emotional reactions of stress, anxiety, stomach hurting, all those things is unproductive or destructive conflict. So if we were to think about productive conflict, so if conflict is a disagreement or difference of opinion or perspective, productive conflict is leveraging that to achieve an outcome and to take care of the relationship. So we got something done And people feel okay about it, or we took steps to repair the relationship if something got, you know, messed up there. Unproductive conflict is conflict that either achieves an outcome, right? We got to a new place, but people feel awful, or people feel great and we actually didn't accomplish something. That's unproductive conflict. And then the one that makes many of us most frustrated is destructive conflict where not only did we not accomplish anything, people feel awful. And so I want to right-size conflict, and I also want to make sure that people are 
leveraging the right kind of conflict. So if you do not have any conflict, if you think to yourself, oh, I hardly ever have a disagreement or difference of opinion or perspective, the other thing you don't have is diversity. You have a whole bunch of replicants of people who see the world exactly the way you do, and that is really not going to lead to innovative, thoughtful, creative, useful outcomes. Yeah, so the productive conflict, I I think you've described it, I'll call it like orders of magnitude or pick your battles. You've described something that was like, a productive one is like, what should we have for dinner? What should we watch on TV tonight? And we can meet all of your criteria for productive conflict and resolve them. And no one, there's no stress or anxiety. What happens when we get to the unproductive side and you're at work and you're in a meeting, maybe two different departments or teams have conflicting goals and you sense it's going off the rails. What would you do? Yeah. So this is the point where you need to what's called get on the balcony. And I think the idea of getting on the balcony came from uh, Ron Heifetz and Marty Linsky in their book on adaptive leadership. So when you're in conflict, you're on the dance floor, you're stepping on each other's toes, you're bumping into each other with sharp elbows, people are getting hurt. When you get on the balcony, you take an observation perspective to notice what's going on here. So think about the difference in a conversation where I would say, you know, Alan, you are not thinking about what's important to us. You're only thinking about what's important to you. And Alan, you say, yeah, but Deb, you know, my job is to focus on this priority for the client. We can't just make everything about you. That's the dance floor and we're stepping on each other's toes. That's That would never win Dancing with the Stars. But if you go up on the balcony and you can notice and name neutrally what is happening rather than what is happening to you by me, it could say, wow, I noticed that we have competing priorities. I noticed that we've been talking about this for 20 minutes and don't seem to have moved further along in our agenda. I notice in me that I'm feeling stuck. How are you feeling? And so that gets us out of the relationship of bumping into each other and looking at it from a a higher level and then figuring out what do we want to do about next steps. Yeah, I love it. It's almost like the emotional intelligence going to the balcony. It's taking a deep breath, taking a step back. And I also like the way you framed it. You started with, I'm feeling like we're not making progress. I wonder how you feel. And I think that's so important, isn't it? Right. Yeah, which is so different than you are keeping us from making progress, which, you know, I get to think, uh, but it's not really productive to say. And I'll, I'll just share with you, I have a little acronym that I created When conversations go like this, I call it how to snap out of conflict. I don't think anybody heard that snap. That was really pathetic. Hold on. There we go. Okay, how to snap out of conflict. So S-N-A-P. So S is stop the conversation, right? If you find yourself in a conversation that is going nowhere, take a time out. I want to pause this conversation for a second. N is what I had said before, notice and name neutrally what's going on and what's going on in you. I noticed that we are talking about different priorities. I noticed we've been talking about this for 20 minutes. And I also noticed that I'm feeling frustrated and stuck. That's the N, notice and name neutrally. The A is ask the other person for their perspective. How do you see it? How are you feeling? So that You're not dominating the conversation. You're getting their input. And then the P is to either propose something moving forward. Here's what I propose we do because this isn't working or to even be vulnerable enough to say, like, I don't really know what we should do here. Do you have a proposal? And be open to some suggestion that will move the conversation forward. But if you keep spinning and spinning and spinning, it will not make things better. It will make things worse. And I think that your SNAP acronym is is just a beautiful thing, right? If I can just stop and think about it and frame it as here's how I'm feeling first, the behaviors that we're learning are just yell, Deb, we're not making any progress. Why are you only focused on you? Right. So uh, here's what I will say, Alan, in the workshops that I lead on navigating conflict, on the workshops that I lead on, you know, communicating with emotional intelligence, 
I basically invite people to name their favorite TV show because chances are the reason they love it is because there is no emotional intelligence, right? High emotional intelligence, other than like Great British Baking Show, doesn't make for great entertainment. I want to watch, you know, it, I mean, this will date me. I want to watch McEnroe having a tantrum on the tennis court, right? I want to <laughs> watch Succession like I did last night. I want to watch people tearing each other up. So, and it's very entertaining, and that's what makes movies and books and television entertaining is this terrible emotional lack of emotional intelligence, but it isn't productive in work and life. Yeah, thank you. I think that's actually brilliantly said. Let's move on to another topic. The literature on expertise and expert performance is, is pretty clear over decades and decades of research. And The one thing that is clear about is the idea of deliberate practice in a feedback-rich environment is how top people become great at something. So giving and receiving feedback is crucial. You don't get to be the best golfer or tennis player or CEO or leader without being really good at giving and receiving feedback. But yet this is one of those things that it's like, it's kind of like conflict. It's like, I'm scared, intimidated. Why? The feedback process, it, it wrangles me up inside. So how do we reframe our thinking around feedback? Yeah. So I think we need to reframe it as both givers and askers of feedback because both of those are hard, right? So first of all, I think it could be really helpful to think about feedback as information. So number one, it's information. It's information about a person's behavior or performance, positive or negative, positive meaning, yes, do more of that. Negative meaning, stop doing that. That's not working. That will help someone grow, develop, and succeed. So being really clear about the intention, both as a giver and as a receiver, that it's not about finding fault, placing blame, shaming. If it is, don't give it. But that it's really about giving somebody useful information that can help them get better at their job. So how do we reframe our perspective? Number one is to understand what it is and what it isn't. Number two, I like to offer this to people in in my programs and workshops is I invite people to think about something that they got significantly better at as a result of feedback. And for anybody who has ever done sports, they definitely got better because they got feedback. I am not athletic. My high school extracurricular activity was speech and debate. And I got feedback every single day after school. I got feedback every single weekend that I competed. I got feedback every summer when I went to speech camp, which I know is such a dorky thing. But I only got better at it. And now it's my job because of getting feedback. So just think about some things that you got better at and the role that feedback had. And I think part of this also goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about who should give you feedback, which is ideally somebody you trust and somebody who's going to be honest with you for the benefit of your current and future self. Most of us have gotten feedback from people who were not that right? We've gotten feedback from people we didn't trust, or we've gotten feedback from somebody who wasn't really invested in our professional development, personal development, even though we trusted them. And so we've got some, you know, psychic injuries, psychological injuries of having gotten feedback that felt bad. And I think one of one of my favorite pieces of research on the topic is the idea that when you give feedback inartfully or receive feedback inartfully, it actually triggers the same part of your brain that registers physical pain, right? So the feelings of social rejection that come with feedback that is about your character rather than your performance lights up the pain center in your brain. And we are smart enough to avoid things that light up the pain center in our brain. So Alan, think about the difference between me saying to you, you know, Alan, when it comes to customer feedback, we like to get back to customers within 48 hours. Could you speed up your process? Versus me saying, Alan, when it comes to customer feedback, you're lazy, right? The first one might feel like an ouch, like a pinch. The second one might feel like a punch. 
And so you want to make sure that that feedback is not about somebody's character, not about their personality, but about an observable, measurable behavior. So the final question that we wrap up, that we ask all our guests, what are you curious about and learning now? I just came back from a three-day facilitator training on Immunity to Change by Robert Kagan and Lisa Leahy. And the idea behind it very quickly is every single one of us have goals we want to accomplish and things we say we want to achieve. We make a list of all the things we should do and shouldn't do. We try it, and then, like a New Year's resolution, we just go back to our old habits. And this model that I've just learned how to facilitate it helps you unpack what you are secretly more committed to than the change you say you want to accomplish. And so I am loving it. I'm applying it to myself. I'm trying to apply it in my coaching sessions and in my workshops to help people get a much deeper understanding of ways in which their bodies and brains are trying to keep them safe from threats, but are also keeping them playing very small. Wow, that's beautiful. I hope we see a Udemy course in the future on helping us find what it is we really want to do that we're, we haven't quite figured out. I hope so too. I'm going to put it on my roster. <laughs> All right, Deb. Thank you so much for joining us on the Leading Up podcast today. Thanks for having me. For more with Deborah Grayson Regal, head to business.udemy.com. She's taught more than 80,000 Udemy business students on improving their leadership communications, how to facilitate effective meetings, and coach for growth and performance. And listeners, this was actually the last episode of season two. We are taking a very short break and leading up, we'll be back with season three. New episodes will drop every week starting Wednesday, June 7th. The Leading Up podcast is produced by Udemy in partnership with Pod People. Special thanks to our production team, Alex Vickmanis, Amy Machado, Brian Rivers, Danielle Roth, and Carter Wogan. Our original theme is by Soundboard.